Hey! A little bit later. Had some issues with the streaming software. Apparently F-Log was on. Whatever the fuck. Doesn't matter. Hello, we're back for another one of these. Good evening, everyone. Jesus, the chat's going crazy already. Chimera's already talking in all caps, so it's going to be a good evening. Audio, video, okay, thanks, Palm to Pimp. What have we got? Let's have a look. Hey, so we've got Darius and Davex, Yuda and Jace and Nacho. Hey, Nacho. Cool, good to see you here. Uh, Palm to Pimp and Barrett and Sergeant Queef and Shin and Bots. That sounds good. Right. And we have coffee. So that'll be applied first. This should be, I'm going to risk saying this, which is going to fuck up everything. This should be an easy stream. We're going to be doing some chromatic aberration. Um, which is, let's just, let me jump on the right machine and we will have a look at what that actually is. So it happens, it's an artifact from real cameras, essentially. Um, it is to do with, with when the lens of your camera, basically when light is focused uh, incorrectly, so you get different focal points for different wavelengths of light, uh, which means you get a slight separation in colors. Now, I'm sure, not sure how this is going to come out in the stream, but to me, you've got these are the proper columns here. You can see blue and red and stuff kind of parting from each other. It's not the best picture. Is there really... I mean, that's really severe chromatic aberration, but a lot of it time you'll just see tinting uh, on the side of objects. And because it's one of those things that happens in real cameras, it's something that is uh, attempting to simulate to try and add that kind of bit of kind of, well, depending on the style of your game, it might be, make it a bit more authentic. It is used often uh, excessively, which can be cool in a demo and can be pretty shitty in a game, um, but there are other people that use it quite well. Apparently the was the what was the latest aliens alien isolation that meant was meant to use it pretty well um let's see if these folks have oh yeah here we go so this is the this is the general idea is different wavelengths of light are going to get focused at different places and uh we'll get a splitting so you'll just see hues more green up here more red down there now ours is going to be obviously not this is very much a simulation um, so what we're going to do is a radial blur, which we'll implement first. Haven't done those before, so that should be fun. And then we have a color ramp function that we're going to multiply um, the color components based on this ramp. And we should get chromatic aberration. Now, I've pushed an episode 20 uh, branch. It's very much just a cut down version of uh, what we have from other weeks. So I am going to start with um, a new file. And we'll implement this radial blur. So the first thing we need, first thing I'm gonna need is coffee, because I've been talking about it, not drinking it. <laughs> Parrot's informing us about his aberrations. That's why we have to talk to you over the internet and not in person. <laughs> um awesome. Right. So first thing, we're just going to draw a texture. So let's let's set up the basis. We'll just blip a texture to the screen, and then we're going to start blurring it. Um, so this is going to be our blur dot vert, and we'll just have make that a vec two. This is one of those pass through stages. So we're just going to return there it is, and we're going to calculate some UVs. Um, the vertex positions are going to be going from minus one to one. Um, so we're going to shift those to the zero to one range, which is nice and simple to do. We plus vert, we half its size, and then we add 0.5 to it. And that's that. Our frag right now is going to be very simple. We're taking a vector. We're taking a sampler, which is to our texture, and we're just going to sample the texture out at those UVs. And then we're going to make a pipeline to stitch all this together. So Arbla. Um, vert, which takes a vector 2. Frag, which takes a vector 2. And we're going to make a little helper function called Radial Blur which is going to take a sampler and just call the stuff we've got here. So 
We're going to map G over R blur um, with a um, quad frag stream. So a um, sorry, the vertex stream that ha contains the vertices for a quad, and we're going to pass up the sampler. Okay, compile all these. Didn't like that one. Why don't you like that one? Um, doesn't like R blur frag. Oh yeah, that's because sampler is a uniform. There we go. And radial blur. Cool. So now if we let's let's load a texture. So around here I should have the good old watt texture. So watt.png. Let's make a nice little global variable for that. Watt sampler. And we'll set that to be um, this. Okay. So now, if everything has gone well, I'm just going to bring up our main loop and throw this in here. If we call radial blur with the wax sampler, it goes wrong. Okay. Yes, because the return value from here has to be a vec full. There we go. Okay, so it's upside down, but that'll do. I don't really care. Um, so we're going to take this function that's just blitz a texture, and we're going to turn it into a little radial blur function. Barrett's saying the Twitch watch count is low. Yeah, and I I don't actually get uh, the data that comes from from Twitch sometimes. I see like 10 of you talking in chat and I go into the um, the viewers list and it's like three people. So I don't fucking know. I blame the gorilla. I'm not gorilla. Right. Um, so where do we start? Okay, so let's go through what we're going to do. Let's, uh, I'm going to need my doodling tools here. Rom MPX. Yes, and the pen is around here. Oh, yeah, actually, here's something, something new. I got a new book. It's so cool. It's all about garbage collection. And I've only just started reading it, and it's ace. So I'm, I'm really excited about this one. This is going to keep me busy for a while. Let's show that. Books. Books are cool. Okay, so the way Radial Blur apparently works... Is you pick a point, it's gonna, we're going to start in the center. And we're going to blur out from here. So for every point, let's say this point. Well, I'm really bad at picking colors right now. Um, we're going to sample along this line. Back towards the center. Doot, 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 and average those together. And that should get us a nice smeary effect. That's going to be very simple to implement, so we're going to do that. Um, we can position this. Uh, focal point, the, sorry, the, the center of our blur anywhere we like. Um, but that's what we're going to do. That's the plan. Okay, the window manager. Oh man, I can't fly in. Couldn't, it was very difficult to read your name there. Uh, yeah, I'm using Stump, as everyone else is saying. It's just nice. I had to customize it a little to make it feel like Emacs. Really, I mean, it was just, I wanted... I wanted to... I, I only have very few windows that aren't Emacs around on this machine. Like, it's a browser and the the GL view. So, um, I mean, ultimately, I would just use Emacs as a window manager, which I did try. Um, but I had problems with... Yeah, when I was making the uh, SDL window, it would just freak out. So, I never got away with that. But, um, yeah, Stump is awesome. One second, Barrett. Are you just... <laughs> Barrett, are you pissing about or is the uh, stream gone funny? Oh, that's strange. Fair enough. Okay, um, glad to see you back. Let's get going. So, everything's we've done in the fragment shader. So we're going to have our... Um, 
I'm going to call it the focus, which is going to be our center point, uh, which is going to be at zero, zero. I actually want all of the positions I'm going to be working in, I want in the, um, in the range minus one to one. So where's my pen gone? I want going from minus one to one, minus one to one, or the other way around. It doesn't really matter. Maths will work the same. Um, so, seems as I already have those um, in vert up here, I'm just going to pass it along as well. So, actually, let's put it here. And when I can compile this, it's going to complain that now these uh, two GPU functions don't match up. Um, so, I need to add an extra argument here. And this is um, fpos, which is a vec2. Apparently I've got a let with an empty body. I have. And this now needs to take another vec2. And hopefully we can just say continue and all is well. Yep. Good. So whatever point we're at, our fpos, um, we're going to, let's see, we're going to have a position and then we're going to subtract the, um, what's it, we want it to go to. So if we do fpos minus the focus, what will that be? So if we were at 10 and it was at zero, then it's going to be going towards the focus. So actually I want to go, I want the vector to go towards the center. So we do it like this. All right, that's the first bit. Now we need a for loop. I still, still need to make the um, Lisp loop macros, uh, like uh, do times and things like this. But for now, this will be fine. So we're going to say i is uh, zero. We're going to loop until while um, i is less than some constant, which we're going to call steps. We're going to start with 64 steps. And we're going to increment by one each time. And then what we do is we're going to integrate a color. So the color is going to be whatever the texture is at fpos. So no. Oh, sorry. Oh, wait a second. It's not quite right, is it? If I do all my positions in um, 0 to 1, I'm going to have to convert to the UVs. So I don't want to do it like that. Oh. Take that out. I thought I could get away with being lazy, but no. Okay, um, so our focus is going to be 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and we'll just do everything from 0 to 1. Um, that's still fine. And, yep, yeah, that's 0 0.5 minus 1 will be negative. Yep, yeah, that's good. Steps. Um, we get the color at the UV coordinates and then we step 64 times and we're going to take this direction and we're going to scale it down. So we'll take the direction and divide it by the number of steps. And I just realized we're going to have to change this let into a let star. And then actually we'll start that at one for reasons. We're going to increment the color um, by, what's it going to be? The texture at our new position. So we're going to where am I looking at? So we do increment UV by uh, scale direction and then increment the color by, you know, whatever it is at our new position. And at the end, we take the color and we divide it by the number of steps. And fpos is undefined, which is correct. x is undefined, is it? Oh yeah, don't know why I did that. Oops. And this now needs to be this, and it's going to complain. Oh, interesting. 
Assignment to varying v in. Oh yeah, okay, so yes, the um, arguments passed in are read-only. That's interesting, why didn't my compiler catch that? Stupid compiler. Hmm. I guess it's that it doesn't know until it's used in the pipeline that the argument is um, immutable. Because an argument passed into a regular function you could you could append to, I think. Um, where are we? <laughs> There's things going on. All right, I'll, I'll finish this off and then I'll um, I'll look at what's going on in chat. F passes UB. Come on, what have I done now? Can't be that many ways to break it. Hey, there we go. Okay, so that's now very blurry and it's smearing outwards. Wait a second, it seems kind of interesting though. I should have picked something with a bit more variation in colour because it's hard to tell. I think this is smearing out in the right direction here. I'm seeing lines that are heading back towards the centre, so I think I'm okay. Um, what I can do, actually, if I scale this down more, so that's 0.1 that. Yeah, that's okay. It kind of looks like a motion blur kind of thing going on. So now rather than stepping all the way from this point to the center, it's um, stepping, you know, what is it? 20% of the way. So about here. And that's why the blur is about yeah, it's about that long. Why am I pointing at that screen with my fingers? I was getting better at doing this with a cursor. Anyway, let's have a look what's going on over here. Dun 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 dun. Jace is saying EX Window Manager has gone much better. Oh, really? You're using it for your main stuff now? That's really cool. I'm blurry. Apparently, I need motion blur too. Um, come on. Bring it back. We can do this. This is all because I won't take five minutes to go and find my camera settings and uh, fix the focal length, but fuck it. Doesn't matter. I can just stay blurry. I'm not that pretty anyway. Right, so. Um... Oh, Barrett, you didn't, hadn't realized I'd started. No, I'd be until I refreshed through. Bloody hell. <laughs> Everything. Right. Um... Jace is saying, really convenient, just having one set of key bindings to track everything. Yeah, man, that sounds fantastic. Um, yeah, I, this thing's really not wanting to bring me back in focus. Oh, fuck it, I'll just hover here until it decides what to do. Come on. There we go. Um... Emacs being single-threaded is one of the disadvantages. Still single-threaded. There's certainly a lot of things that can run in the background because, like, making HTTP requests and all that kind of stuff, like, heavy processing doesn't block everything. Oh, maybe it does, actually. Some of the plugins certainly do. Hmm. That would be... That would suck, actually. Oh, it's, pr it's pr written perfectly carefully to avoid blocking pretty much anywhere. Yeah, I guess that's why I haven't been hit by it too bad most of the time. I have had it a couple of times, now I think about it. Uh, especially to do with... I, I put it down to single um, plugins, though. But, whatever. Ugh, global interpreter locks. That's why I got this! So I can understand these things! Like, I, it's one... Oh, I'll rant about that, but it's just... It's such an interesting space, and I know only theoretically, it's like, oh yeah, this is the mark and sweep type algorithm, and this is this. And I know roughly what that is in my head, but the practicalities of implementing it, it's just, I want to know details. It's going to be cool. Um, I will try out um, EXWM then. And I, Jace, the fact that you're doing that means that Keppel's been playing nice with it too, which is cool. Oh man, but Stump is really good. I mean, to be honest, it just stays out of the way. Anyway, enough talking about that. Um, 
A lot of the libraries call out to external process to allow background pressing. Indeed. Yes. Right. Stop distracted, Chris. Get back on the thing. Okay, so we've got a radial blur. That's nice. This is cool. Um, so we're actually a good chunk of the way there. Um, what we need to do now is add a color ramp. And this stuff is already uh, already kind of implemented. I want to see if I can find a post about this. Um, color ramp. It's got to be someone implementing this stuff. Red Giant, maybe them. Oh, no, I don't know. Boring. Oh, man. This is one of these times I haven't looked any of the, um, looked up any links, because I'm just really loving the fact that basically guys at work have done a lot of their stuff before so it took them like two minutes to explain the process to me and uh, there's a couple of implementations um, that I want to try out tonight and I would really love to um, oh, what is it going to be what do, what do we search to find things on this um, You really need to see this the picture of the color ramp. It just helps stuff a lot. Nope. What was the um, latest game by the guys who did... Um... Oh, well, that helps. I'm going to make a reference to a game that I now I can't remember. Limbo. What was it? Inside? Yeah, Inside. The chromatic aberration in that, when they gave their talk at GDC or whatever, um, they... Again, the, the technique they referenced was from one of the guys that I work with. Um, so it's just kind of nice. I just give a chat and say, how do you do this? Which is really cool. Um, but, oh, well. Chromatic Aberration. Let's just see if Cosmos got anything on it. That's the dude. But... Won't well, put his Twitter feed up on the stream. Okay, so this little color ramp down here, this is actually roughly what I'm going for. Um, so what we do is over, we're gonna smear a pixel, uh, text or fragment rather, over a certain distance, like this. And then we'll say that this is zero and this is one, and we're gonna sample this um, this color ramp from zero to one and multiply our colors by it. And what it means is at the beginning, we'll be getting all red, then we'll be getting all green, then we'll be getting all blue at the end. But what's important about the structure of this ramp is that all of the, like the sum of all the areas is one. Like it would be very easy to create a ramp which just has red going straight down and straight up to blue. Um, as you can see, the amount of area then covered by the green is larger than the blue and the red, and you get green tinting on everything. So it's important to get that right. And luckily, we've already got this stuff implemented. Now, there's two ways of doing it. Now, oh, sorry, two ways I'm going to uh, talk about doing it. One is you can have a function which generates this ramp, um, which is cool. And I do have that function already in on a branch of Nineveh, so we'll bring that in. Um, but there's another way of doing it, which is you make a texture with three, <laughs> a one dimensional texture with three pixels in it, a red one, a green one, and a blue one, and you just sample it. And that, and the interesting thing about that, ends up being faster, which is really stupid in most, in certain cases. You have to test it, but it generally is less heavy because you, like, you're shifting work off the ALU into just a texture sampler. It's such a small texture, it can all fit in the cache, like, things just work out. And it's one of those things that's not obvious, but that's why, like, working with these folks is awesome. Because it's just like, yeah. This is correct. Uh, there was a great uh, rundown. Him and another chap uh, chatting about it on, on Twitter, breaking down the implementation. It's cool. Anyway, we, we should be trying that out today as well. But first, we're going to do the function version. It works. 
Right, on a branch I have, um, where is it? Feature of chromatic aberration. That's it. I'm just going to pull this in. I'm not going to bother merging that branch because it's so old that the layout's completely different. Um, actually, let's just dump this here and I'll add it to Nineveh later. Oh, come on. Don't need that silliness. Okay, so this is the ramp. That gets that gets us um, a result, which between zero and one is going to be this, and that's cool. So, um, how's the best way of doing this? Well, actually, hmm, this can be simpler than I thought. Let. Um, Factor is aberration color ramp stateless and it's um, 64 divided by i. No, i divided by 64. Yeah, that might be it. Okay, so it's returning a vector four, is it? Why are you returning a vector four? Multiplying a vector three. Oh no, this is the vector four. Whoops. What's the quickest way to get around this? Let's let's do it properly. Swizzle X Y Z here. Do that there. Ooh, interesting. Uh, I'm screwing with the types of something, so assuming that this is a fragment shader. this You'll sometimes see this in Keppel, you'll get a bunch of errors and it's saying, hey, we're getting slightly different things based on um, whether we treat this function as if it was in a vertex stage or a fragment stage or a tessellation stage. Um, this can be a bit much, so you can then retest assuming one particular stage of Keppel. So this is a fragment stage, I'm going to hit 5. And then we get the full stack trace into the compiler as well. Um, ink F. Oh yeah, that's because this also needs swizzling. <laughs> no, that was strange. Oh, there we are. Ah, oh, come on, that's great. There, I'm seeing blue and red and all that split right now. That is cool. Okay. So, it is a bit dark though. What am I doing wrong as far as... So, I would have expected the general um, brightness to stay about even. Because we're... We're multiplying by this factor. Let's just remove that for a second and see what we were getting before. So that was bright. Oh, come on. The other way. And now it's much darker. Now, just trying to work that out. The reason I'm a little confused about that is even though we're taking away all the um, green and blue here and we're like, like there should still be the same level of brightness. We're just moving uh, where the different colors are. Like we're separating out those wavelengths, but they should still total up to one. So I'm not exactly sure what I've done here yet. That will work out soon. There's 64 steps. Oh yeah, why am I doing less than 64? Hold on. Oops. 64. Steps. Steps. Yeah. And we've done that again. What'd I do? 
That's interesting, though. Wait, I just had this a second ago. 64, 64. Ooh. Strange. It's interesting. Anyway. Come back to that in a second. Push! Thank you, sir. Good point. This is kind of working, so we should push it. Um... And then I need to look at the chat to see if everyone else has just worked out why it's dark and I just haven't yet. Um, this is something I get in such... I, I'm so used to the fact that Emacs will mostly complete everything automatically correct that I type English and I expect autocomplete to just work and know what's in my head. Stupid Chris. Right. Okay, it's gone. You have it. Alright, let's see what's going on in the chat. Get some coffee. Ah oh, man, that is abysmal pun. That that's staying right where it is. Um Yes, I obey. Right. Huh. I pick three because of... Because splitting the three things, I don't like it. I don't like that that brings me roughly to where it should be. Uh, let's have a think. Okay, so... Here's the first sample, and then we're going to do um, 63 more samples. We are going to... Each time... Um, Sample this ramp. I suppose we could check to make sure that this ramp is returning the values it should be. By turning it into a regular list function. Alright, below 1 um, by 0.1. Select cap test. That is not a single float. Correct. Oh yeah, it's saturated. I don't think we have a... Oh! We do have saturate functions. That's interesting. Oh yeah, but they're for... Um, they're for floats and not for vectors. So, do we have a V3 saturate? No. Okay, fine. Um, that's something to go on the to-do list, at least. Oops. So what we're looking for here... Um, actually... What we're looking for is to start at full red, for that to drop down and then stay off, which it does. Um, for green to slowly rise, hit one, and then fall away again, which it does. And for blue to rise towards the end. Oh, wait a second, I actually have... Um, we have uh, some graphing functions as well. We could always throw those in there. I don't think we need them in this case. 0.01. We can see roughly that in this data we're getting this ramp. So that's cool. Actually... 
the green and the blue and then I cross over each other at halfway. So at 0 0.5 on the green. Yeah, roughly the same there. Okay, that's good. So yeah, for quickly throwing the GPU function down into a list function and and testing, that works. That's another thing that gets really tempting. Like in these simple cases, it would be great to just be able to compile to, li to this to both GPU and Lisp code and allow you to call it whenever. Um, the problem is then you have to make sure that the Lisp code evaluates to exactly the same thing as the uh, GLSL would. Otherwise, you're misleading yourself, which is sucky. Um, yeah. That's what, actually, one thing we can do to work out how other people are doing this. Let's go search Shader Toy for chromatic aberration. Oh, this is going to fuck my... Uh, Computer, isn't it? Oh well. I really wish they would. Uh... Um. Oh yeah, there's Ferris. <laughs> that's the mate. That's my mate who was uh, teaching me this stuff the other day and explaining uh, Christmas trick as well. So. Oh yeah, this is uh, this is when they were noodling out how to optimize this ramp function into the one that I eventually stole and put in Nineveh. So um, so that's cool. But what else did I want? Just wonder how they're using it. So, but this is, this is slightly different. Oh, nice. There's uh, Cosmo being referenced again. Right. I just want to know when they use this stuff. Hornet's great as well. Uh, the person that made this. His um, implementation of 2D graphing functions is what I based mine on. And it's why the R's don't have horrible um, aliasing in the in the graphs, which is really cool. So even for really high frequency uh, functions, the graph that we get out is correct. So this dude, love him. Right. Um, dun, 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 dun. Would you excuse me a minute while I just noodle my way through this and find out what's going on. Yeah, let's have a look at a couple of these. No, actually, let's uh, not worry about. It. Let's just go look at a radial blur. Uh, radial blur. There we go. By IQ, perfect. So, here's is a nice fancy one, uh, but we can simplify this a lot. So here is the loop with yeah 64 steps in this case. Um, hey, he's got he's got a multiplication factor as well of 3.5. That probably has a reason then. Um, let's just let's chop this down. So he's got some time component up here. Uh, we don't need any of this, I don't think. Yes, yeah, so ultimately it just comes down to sampling a texture. Um, at P times 0 0.3, it's for short arrays, I guess. X, Y, Y really doesn't matter. We can use X, Y. Let's see what happens if I do this. Whoops. Return is not matching the right type. Fine, X, Y, Y. Yeah, there we go. Now we haven't got any of the animation. And we've got some of the blur. Um, yeah, this is very similar. This is the difference. So from the origin, this is in ours, this was called focus. Uh, minus the position divided by the number of steps. 
um, for i below the number of steps. Deform, well, this actually can just, if we just take this. Oh, I'm forgetting which system I'm on. Take that out and call syntax error. What have I done? Oh, yeah. Semicolons, blah. Oh, wait a second. Chris, are you being an idiot? I think you are. Oh, I know. I know. So wait a second. That just returns this. Right? Oh, yeah, because P probably means something down here. Okay, right. We take this. They passed in S, so that becomes S times 0 0.3. Problems, problems everywhere because I'm an idiot. Col, again, same issues, semicolons. Man, I love me some Lisp. <laughs> okay, there we are. So he's using a smooth step function. I guess it's to get the fall off. Um, What's W in this case? There's some kind of waiting going on there. Oh, okay, so the waiting, this is... So as things further get, get further away, W falls off. So we don't need that. Now everything's a bit brighter. Um, and then there's some smooth step thing going on here from 0 to 1. Let's just see what happens when we take that out. Very bright, blimey. But again, it is dark when... Okay, so I'm not going to worry about mine having this fudge factor for, for now because there seems to be something I can read up on why that is later. So yeah, that's roughly a uh, kind of basic chromatic aberration. We can start tweaking this with um, the length of this um, here. We can just scale it. So 0.1, 0.05. Acts a little more reasonable, but isn't fun for the stream. So let's put it. Yeah, you can put it way up. Cool. I mean, of course, we don't just have to do this on this texture. So if we go back to play with verts, and when we draw the scene, uh, let's just move this down here. Let's go make an FBO. And a sampler for the scene. Let's go and set our scene FBO to be make FBO. We'll give it one color attachment and one depth attachment. And then we will get the attachment texture uh, from scene FBO and sample that and then set the scene sampler to be that and then we can take this fbo and render into it with fbo bound uh scene fbo why didn't everything go away oh yeah because we're doing this radio blur thing down here so now there should be nothing but if we put prog in here for example we would see why don't we see anything Oh yeah, because the clear is afterwards. Ah, oh, forget it, never mind. We're rendering a scene <laughs> into this FBO. Um, we should also clear that FBO every time as well. Before rendering into it, then we clear the screen. Then we call radio blur with the scene sampler. And we get our scene blur, rather than just that what thing. And then we can fly around. And we got cool colory shit going on and yeah that's your basic chromatic aberration stuff i, I do want to try a cosmos trick of um just packing those the three colors into a texture and sampling it um the reason i'm not going to ship that version with uh, Nineveh is that because it requires creating a texture, we would have to own that resource for you. And I'd rather just have a stateless function uh, in Nineveh and leave optimization to other people. Um, and let us jump back to chat because there's things going on. Stuff has been pushed. Dun, 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 dun. 
Life coding the N64 emulator. Oh yeah, like um, is that uh, Barrett? Is that Ferris's stuff you're looking up? That dude's awesome. So like uh, yeah, he, the um, the Rustendo 64, uh, his emulator is on pause at the moment because he's been doing a Virtual Boy emulator for a while. Um, so they've got most of that working. They're chasing down some nasty ass bugs in there, which is just the kind of things you get. Um, oh, I'm out of focus again. Things you get when you start working on those kind of problems, but really cool and like jumping between real hardware and emulation and various emulators to prove what's going on. It's awesome. Um, actually, yeah, I should send you some links. Since I'm talking about these people, um, let's throw some uh, some links in the chat. So we have um, that's Ferris's stream. Let's ah right. And then he's in a group called uh, Demosing group called Logicoma, so I recommend checking their stuff out. Um, if you want to see <laughs> chromatic aberration used very heavily, uh, look at Elysian or um, wait a second, which, which one's? Yeah, that was the Turisac one. Almost Infinite is also awesome. Yeah, they, they're doing great stuff, especially in 64K category. Uh, and then... The other dude I was mentioning, Kuzma. It's also pretty fantastic. Um, highly recommend checking out Hurtquake. It's a bloody awesome demo. Um, yeah. Those are the people I've been yakking about. Okay. Darius, now combine it with the um, depth buffer on the scene and make it blur depending on depth. Good idea. We'll do that, actually. Um, we've got loads of time. Yeah, it's not even 9 o'clock yet. It's such a simple effect. But what I do want to do uh, before we go any further is to... Wait a second. Are we... We're blurring away from objects at the moment. We're blurring... Are we blurring away from the center or are we blurring towards the center? I think we're blurring towards the center. No, that's fine. It's okay. Never mind me. Talking shit again. Um... Oh, sorry, did you write that? I can't remember now. Whoa! Right. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh yeah, I wanted to test this other thing first. So we want to make a texture. Let's uh, get back into the blur stuff. Defr, and we will have a... Um, a sampler, a lookup texture sampler, lookup table rather. Uh, we make a texture, its initial contents are going to be very simple. We're going to have 100, zero, zero, um, zero, zero, 001, whoops, zero, 010, zero, 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 001, that should be correct. <laughs> And our element type is going to be, well, it's just going to be RGB. Um, RGB 8? Yeah, that'll do. <laughs> we'll see if that's right. Uh, Lut sampler. Whoops. Error. Pass passing things to the hoo-ha. Yeah, fine. Whatever. Um, Lut sampler. There we are. Let's see if that contains what we think it should contain, play with verts, come down here, say draw text, lot sampler, what? Well done something really stupid here. Probably. Uh, texture one. Oh yeah, wait. Wow, that was a really bad error message. Given what that actually was. Valid index one for single array should be non-negative integer below one. Wow, that's crap.
Okay. Um, no, that's uh, sorry. This is too bad. I need to find out what the fuck what it was calling. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it, it's expecting all of these to be. Uh, two-dimensional textures huh well that's dumb okay so I need to add an issue for that I'll, I'll just do that now save Jace doing it because he does it every week um, what am I searching for Nineveh Basp. issues new issue draw text with ugly error and not to the texture. So myself, it's a bug. Cool, right. Um, so we won't use draw text because apparently that's funky right now. So screw it, never mind. Just carry on where we were. Um, And get back to the code. What were we doing? Oh yeah, so we wanted to make an alternate version of this blur. And the only difference is going to be we're changing out this function. Um, we're just going to call texture on the ramp sampler. Texture ramp yada yada. That should be it. Do, do, do. Come on then, what did I do? Oh yeah, float. Oh, it still didn't like that. What did I do? Again, things. GLSL function multiply when called argument types vec4 and vec3. Of course, factor again. YZ. That's better. Blur two is our blur frag two. And then we've got this one here. Let's see if I've screwed it up. If I have, it'll look very different. Radio blur, our blur two. Oh yes, that's very different. <laughs> okay. That's that's clearly not right. Let's see what I've done. Oh, and again. Um, oh, wait. I haven't passed up. Ah, oh, Chris, what are you doing? Radial blur too. Let's do that, and we need to pass up the uh, ramp. And there's a couple of other problems here. So the, currently the lookup sampler variable is holding just a texture rather than a sampled texture. So it should be holding a sampler. So we will say sample that. That's a little bit better. And then this will be passed into here. And then if we go back to play with verts dot lisp radial blur two. <laughs> In correct type of sampler pass to shader. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> that is correct. Good old type checking. Um, this is a 1D. Which means this wasn't meant to take a vector 2. Oh, toys. Now that's very wrong too. <laughs> Oh well, we're getting somewhere. I think we're getting closer. Who knows? Uh, sampler texture of that. Pull G that. Wow, that's wrong. That's very wrong. Okay. 
How did it manage to screw up those values so bad? Uh, I guess that's because I pushed them up as floats and um, yeah, I should have done them as normalized. So when I made this here, so let's um, let's do a couple of things. Let's no, let's let's just do this again. So, oh come on, mistype all the things. Let's just make this two five five. 255, 255. And I don't think I need these to be vectors at this point. I can't remember how my um, marshalling stuff works. So let's just see what happens here. Oh, well, that works. So, um, and we'll make a temp file for a minute. Temp zero is that. So temp zero is that texture. And then if I pull G that texture, wow, that is so wrong. Well, that sucks. Huh. How is that so out of whack? Bugs! More bugs! <sighs> okay, right, well, let's, uh... Couple issues. That's a reason that's the top of the list. Right. from lists um, well at least the the uh, at least the visual stuff is correct to given the data I've been giving it which was just garbage so um do that and we'll leave issues open because it seems like we're gonna have plenty of them today <sighs> right what's going on just saying not any uh not like it's any trouble putting up issues uh thank you i really appreciate it um but yeah, this time, this time I've got to file them up. Don't know why. <laughs> What's going on here? Oh no, things are going wrong. Shit. Echoes? Some crazy echo going on. That's bullshit. What the fuck? Desktop audio um, is completely off. Oh, wait. <laughs> You've got Ferris' stream open. Sorry, I'm, I'm catching up with the chat now, so I'm experiencing <laughs> this in life. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, oh, good old Ferris. A sign bug to Zelf, definitely. Right. How? <laughs> so the question is, how are these values so fucked up? It's very odd. Let's just um, set the initial contents to nil and the dimensions to three. It's RGB eight. Let's pull G that. Now that should be full of that like that's completely valid to be full of garbage. I have no problem with that because we don't initialize those things. Um, let's pull one G. Where is that? So it's like this, isn't it? Would you get us a C array? Let's set up uh, temp zero to be that. Um, yeah. And we can pull G on that and we get the same thing, which makes sense. And then so we can push G to temp zero. I guess I just need to have a look first at what this does. 255, 
zero 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 two five five zero 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 two five five. Don't do it like that. That's that's the wrong way to do this. And then pull temp zero again. Okay, so that's where the problem is. Pushing things to UN eight vec three is arst. Which bits of this do I actually want? Let's take. this actually let that ah, leave it alone that's that's all useful stuff right is is to me okay so now the next questions are what happens if i do this because these are technically floats now like yep that's completely wrong that's kind of what i would expect to be honest um, but again, if, if, if the types aren't valid, it should throw a type error and not just sit there doing a shitty thing. That's interesting. Um, how have I got away with this so far? It's kind of worrying. Because I've got, <laughs> I got plenty of code doing this kind of stuff. I could be super lazy. Let's actually, yeah, that's a good point. What happens if... What happens if I do this and just do vec3? Um, okay. So it looks like it just comes down to the fact that I've tested stuff with Vect and floats way more than I have for the UNs. Um, I mean, the texture now is a float texture. So if we if we just go up and inspect. How do you inspect things under the cursor? I can never remember. Control V I or something. No, <laughs> not like that. Not like this. Right. Um, oh, well, that kicks it down there. That'll be fine. Yeah, so now we can see we've got an RGB 32 float as its type, so yeah, let's just try that. Let's see what happens. Let's set f uh, lookup texture sampler to be sample this. Ooh, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> Definitely doesn't look the same as the other one. I think I might just leave that down for later experiments because, oh no, wait. They look exactly the same. Shut my face. Okay. That's that's definitely running different code. Cool. Okay, so that's that's at least the implementation of that part. Um, cool. So that's both the techniques. So it's just I've got bugs in Keppel with regarding to pushing data up to. Fuck, that is really embarrassing. I wonder if that's a regression, because I'm just amazed I managed to get so far with that kind of issue. Anyway, um, let's switch back over to chat. Hey, is Phil Fogg arrived? Hey, man, wherever you are. Jason is saying, I treat, keep trying to get into UZBL, Uzbel? Uh, but despite its promises and technical delivery on truly impressive flexibility, it's still way too much effort to integrate to my workflow. What is that? Oh, is that uh, another browser thing? Interesting. Yeah, I tried Conqueror for a while. To be honest, again, it's just, I need the muscle memory to be, like if I can get Emacs key bindings into other things, I just move quicker, so. That is why. Anyway, 
It's nine o'clock now. Oh, I've got, still got plenty of coffee. Nice cold coffee. I will need a top up soon though. Ah, I think now we do um, exactly what. Now I'm going to credit the wrong person. Who said it? Was it Jace? Saying do this based on depth, or was it Darius? Da -da 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 -da. Uh, oh, actually, I missed a question before all the echoey stuff. Um. <laughs> Let's have a look. Oh yeah, uh, Nacho, I'm using uh, Firefox and um, yeah, Vimperator with a load of Emacs key bindings in it. Dun dun dun. <laughs> Getting scheme jokes, that's nice. Oh, that's always, it's always a good day. Right. And then I was asked, how much better or worse do you reckon live coding would be if you could do all this stuff with visual components? It's a good question. Um, I've the live coding thing is such a spectrum, right? Like you've got, I mean, what we're doing here is live coding, but it's a very low level live coding and it's compared to say shader toy, which limits its scope really nicely. So like in, in some ways you move faster in shader toy because that's your entire environment. There's there's not so much you can do, and so the, all the expressiveness is is just in there. And it's the same for it's the same for, like yeah. I suppose it's it's same with a bunch of things. If you're working with bigger building blocks, you can that are designed well, you can move faster. Um, I made Keppel to be like relatively low level, so we're still dealing with GL itself, um, but we could make a higher level language that sits on top. Oh, high level abstraction and um, we could move much faster with that and again that's really what your engine does it picks a load of good defaults and provides you a, a language for for interfacing um, so you can see things like um, what's the super collider thing in closure well there's a bunch of super collider ones like um oh what's it called i can't remember anyway a lot of the um audio ones you can get some really cool uh, live audio coding tools and so the visual stuff yes would help but I think it helps more because you're working with big components than it does um, from a language point of view there's some parts of it certainly like being able to grab a value and and tweak it and some things do work better spatially um, actually there's also a chap who's doing uh, that stuff in common lisp He's a, a South Korean gentleman, if I remember correctly. I, I get emails from him occasionally because he uses Vario, which is like, I get really proud because I see this big screen, a load of music, and a load of visuals, and it's like Vario in the corner. I'm like, <laughs> that's awesome. Make, I just I love, love that that guy's doing that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I struggle to see. Okay, okay. So I, I've my my mind's racing a bit because we've done a, a, the people I work with have done some work with visual programming languages as well. When I first moved over to Norway, the company was called um, Outrax, and we were working on a product called Real Time Studio, and it was a kind of three D authoring thing, three D media thing. And it again, the co that 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 goal of the company failed because again it was very underspecified what we were doing, and game engines just like at our lunch completely. But the compiler tech is what went into Fuse, and a lot of the rendering background is from there. Um, but there we had a kind of a noodle graph thing where you have blocks and you connect the things together and it composes shaders and all this kind of stuff. And some really smart compiler shit that was um, generating the GLSL, way, better, way more advanced than what I'm doing here. And um, it's very easy... To, for that to get just as, to get more bloated than text is. Text is actually quite, I mean, this has really good uh, data density, not always good information density. Um, yeah, it was, it, it's very hard. Like the noodle kind of programming view works really well with kind of declarative uh, programming styles because the 
you're, you're never having to deal with the values themselves, just the kind of the information that's flowing through the system. So you're more interested in the interconnections of things. But there are some things that just need to be done iteratively. And then as soon as you mix the metaphors inside those graphs, things get really ugly and it just becomes really difficult to manage. So some things are just straight up better to write and some things are good visually. Um, that's I'm not sure if that answers the question actually, but that's kind of where my head is on that stuff right now. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, but to be honest, I'd, I'd love to be able to just grab a value in here and slide it around. I'm going to have to do some UI stuff. I'm going to have to get back to doing UI stuff in this at some point. But UI is, uh, it's hard. It's hard to do good UI. As I'm sure Shimera will tell you as well, because he's been doing some stuff recently. <laughs> Phil Fogg, yeah, you! Uh, Barrett saying GJS makes reference to the density thing too in SIP lecture videos. What's GJS? Or is that, um, no, I can't work out who that would be. It's Gerald J. Sussman. That's going to be who it is, isn't it? Yeah, it's, um, it's a tricky problem. One of the things that actually still interests me is that, um, okay, so, uh, John McCarthy, obviously invented Lisp, was asked in one of the interviews about um, was being asked again about programming stuff in general. And he was talking about the value of being able to transform between different representations of code. Like not just in one direction, but also back again. And he said that Lisp kind of satisfied that. And that's what I really like. The fact that he wasn't satisfied with where S expressions had got to. Because again, you transform but you're not maintaining the mapping between different representations of code. This is what I took away. This isn't his words from that. And it would be interesting to have those kind of take a function like this and be able to transform it into different views there and back again, maintaining those things. But that's not something you can really do just in a text representation. You're going to have to have this those mappings stored somewhere. And Every time I think about this, my brain goes towards code databases again, and I'm just like, ah, I can't can't think about that right now. Uh, yeah, M expressions are ugly as fuck. Well, yes, a uh, lot of the time. There are some moments that infix is nicer though, right? So there, there are specific places where it can be more valuable to have, um, to be dealing with something in a different representation. So like, Okay, so one of the things that we did when we were interfacing, um, where I work at Fuse, uh, we have to interface um, to the native language of the platform. So we have a, a language called Uno, which cross compiles to, any, to all the platforms. Um, but you want to be able to talk to the native APIs of the platform, Java, Objective-C stuff and all this kind of thing. And we originally went down the uh, bindings route. We generate bindings for the entire language. You can write straight in Uno and we call out to those other languages. But it actually ended up sucking a bit because then whenever you see a code snippet, mo most of the time, if like if the system you're using is good, the only time you want to get through the abstraction is to do something very specific. I've got this code snippet on Stack Overflow. I want that in my code. So if you have bindings, then you have to translate that snippet into the bindings, which is like a third language with its own properties. And the way errors are exposed, it can never be seamless. Um, so sometimes just being able to use the syntax, in the end we went for something called, we, we call foreign code, which is just you specify a method um, and you say, hey, the body of this method is Java, the body of this method is Objective-C, the body of this method is Swift. You write the code in the method body and you call it so the interface is in the host language, but the body is in a separate language. Um, it doesn't mean that Java is pretty and it doesn't mean that Objective-C is pretty. It means that sometimes the representation is just is more useful than fucking around with something else. It's 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 tricky, and it's something I'm. There, I guess the reason I'm ranting about this is I'm still reconciling a lot of this stuff in my head. So yeah, <laughs> I don't know what all that was about, but it obviously was in there, and now it's your problem. So yeah, please feel free to re-ask the question and what <laughs> it was meant to be. Uh... Oh yeah, Objective C is pretty. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's small talk covered in cement. Right. Um, 
What were we doing? Oh yeah, somebody mentioned about doing uh, this stuff based on the depth. So let's go and have a look at the depth buffer. So, um, playwithverse.lisp, the scene sampler. Okay, so scene depth sampler, we want one of this. Depth. Oh, we're only an hour and a bit in. Oh man, I ranted for like 10 minutes straight. That is not good. Maybe it's, yeah, it's your problem. <laughs> Who comes to see this stuff every week? What's wrong with you? Right, uh, attachment text. And we want to get the scene FBO, seeing as that's what we're rendering it. We want to get the depth component. Um, of course, I've done the same thing again, where I've actually just put the texture in here rather than the sampler. Now we've sampled that. Now what I want to do is just draw this texture. Um, scene depth sampler. Okay, so that's that's the depth values in our scene. Which is cool. But one is further away. So let's go and use that. Let's... Alright, what I'm actually going to do, I'm going to... We'll push this code. Um, go lookup table version. And I'm going to push that and then I'm going to remove this for now because we don't need this. We'll just use the original one. this test function anymore either. I didn't want to compile that. Okay. So we are going to pass in a second uniform. Oh yeah, because we're calling radial blur 2 right now. So let's ch change this back to radial blur and pass in the scene depth sampler. We'll get rid of this for now. And now we want to query the depth for our given position. So let's just do texture depth at UV and Oh, don't comment that out. And we're just getting the X component because we only need one component. Um, and then we want to change this scale direction. So the, and the way we're gonna do this, let's just do a really simple one first. We'll do one minus depth. And there we go. The closer it is, the or is it the further away, the larger the aberration? Is that what I've done? Something like that. Yeah, when I get up close, it just goes away. Because, yeah, one is... <laughs> this is one of the things. I still don't remember which way around it is. So, the further away it is, the brighter... Oh no, yeah. So zero is close, one is far away. So that should just get brighter and brighter and then... Ah yeah, but our depth range is uh, kind of tricksy here. Okay, so let's... Let's just multiply it by depth for a start, that'll be interesting. Draw text. Whoa! <laughs> Fucking hell. That is over the top. Let's get far away and then hopefully it'll fall off. 
That's kind of cool, though. All oh, right. Okay. Now I'm seeing how. Okay. There is a um. There's a technique. Um, called uh. Oh, what's it? It's it's screen space crepsula rays, and they're god rays. You know that thing where you've got the clouds and the sun, and then it just shines out, and you get big old rays of light coming down. Um, one way to do that. Um, in a game is to make the light like a really bright object and all of the solid things to be black. So you have white is your like a white sphere is your light and loads of black objects and then you do a radial blur like this and the objects contribute black to it and the light object contributes white and you get these big rays and then you can just add that to your original scene and that's a form of doing that god rays in screen space. So you can do it as a post pass essentially which is awesome. Um, so I'm kind of interested in doing that at some point. Um, yeah. So let's have a look. What did we do originally? We had 0 0.3, which got it to there. Now I want... Then do 1 minus depth. So in the worst case, it should get to that. So when we get close up, I haven't quite, this quite worked out yet. It still feels like further away is getting more aberration than, I don't know. Not depth minus one. Anyway. I'll work out that in a second. <laughs> I haven't actually done much swift work yet, like barely at all. Like kind of the only stuff I've touched has been directly talking to some iOS API. So I haven't really had a feel of the language. It kind of turned me off at the beginning because it just didn't seem to be doing something fundamentally new in an interesting way. So maybe I've unfairly characterized that language. I should visit it again at some point. Um, oh, that's an interesting link from Barrett. K-Y-T-H-E, Kaith. Let's have a look at this. Oh, building tools that work with code. Okay, I don't have to look at that later. I will get sucked into that. All right. So. There's a couple of things I want to know here. First off, let's go and look at that sampler I'm passing up, the depth sampler. So scene depth sampler. And we'll just get the sampler texture of this and come on, Chris. <laughs> Full G. Oh, okay, so I haven't got a conversion from a depth component 24 to a pixel format yet. Interesting. Well, that's fine. I mean, it has to be between 0 and 1, given what we were seeing before. Um, I wonder if maybe I just, let's take the camera, where is it, oh, not like that. We take the camera and we get its, um, was it the far? Yeah. We set the far plane to be much nearer. Then, oh, I'm not sure how to explain this. The far plane is much nearer. The, the uh, depth value ranges are going to be slightly different. Actually, maybe we should store uh, the depth linear rather than logarithmic. Then we'll probably, um, we'll probably have something more interesting. Yeah, I think we're going to do that. Something like that. All I want to see is, as we get further away, the... Um, The, uh, ah, the blur gets smaller. Because at the moment I feel like, yeah, when we're really close. 
Oh no, the, the reason it's small there is because um, obviously I'm really near the center of the screen. Okay. Hmm. Not sure what I'm achieving right now. We will see. So, I'm going to go and put the... depth stuff back in and I'm going to draw it down in the bottom right or apparently I'm not going to draw it in the bottom right what the hell that's weird seems like it's another day where everything needs to be a bit funky okay <laughs> that'll do um I guess what I could do, let's let's take this, multiply by depth. See, this is not one, so this should be a bit more controlled than I'm seeing here. You know what? Given this amount of stuttering, I think I should probably go and grab a coffee. I'll be two minutes, and we'll carry on with this. There's not really anything much to do now, because we've, we've achieved everything pretty much that I wanted to. But I will go grab a coffee, and we'll noodle around a bit more. Let's hit the button. Where is the button? Back again. Right. Okay. So, I think what we could do is rather than um, using the depth buffer, which naturally is going to be um, logarithmic depth, uh, we want some kind of linear depth. So, what we could do is, seeing as when we render the scene, where do we render the scene? In here. We aren't actually using, because we're not doing any blending with that last component. Um, we can use it for something. We know that our... Um, we can actually just store the depth here. So if we do frag depth... Um, what is... GL frag depth. There we go. Oh no, we can't do it like that because that's going to be logarithmic depth. We will need to pass another value along. So this is linear depth. Uh, which is a vector 2. No, it's not. It's a float. Um, we'll put 0 here for now. And out of here, we've got a clip position, a world, normal, and a UV coming out. Uh, we also want a depth. Um, we're doing everything model to world and then world to clip. We actually kind of want to... I made this smaller so it's just less code to shove on here. But we kind of want this to be in... Um, in view space. Do I want it to be in view space? Hmm. Yeah, clip space would be fine, I think. Let's have a think. 
Then it'll be from 1 to minus 1, so we could shift that. Yeah, that might work. Yeah, let's just see what happens. Let's take the uh, Z component. Um, ah. Come on. Z component of the clip position. And we'll pass that on. It's going to complain for a second while we reconfigure this. And then everything will be fine. Um, and then... So our, our depth there is going to be from 1 to minus 1, I think. Sorry, minus 1 to 1. Whatever. Um, so we can just do our normal trick of... Whoops. Um, times by 0.5 uh, plus 0.5 to the linear depth. I don't know why I'm doing it in the fragment shader. It doesn't really matter. Um, so now we've written that linear depth into the where is it into the scene sampler so we can't see it here but we're using the rgb coordinate says normal and then we're using the w coordinate for the linear depth um i wonder if there's a way for us to just check that quickly that we're not being stupid of course we can right let's go to blur and the sampler we pass in to Sam is just the scene. So if we do some, uh, if we do texture Sam UV, we should just get the regular scene. Yep. Let's get rid of draw text for now because it's not helping us. Um, and so then, if we take just the W component of that and remember to give some other components because we've learned from the other stream that otherwise that's garbage. Okay, that's just one. Why is it just one? Ah, because the linear... Wait a second. This will need to be divided by the W coordinate, right? Or maybe not. Maybe I'm just wrong. <laughs> huh. Maybe about that. All backwards then. That's a bummer. Because these values just look like constant. I would have expected to see some difference there. Okay, we'll do it a different way. We'll do it in view space. Um, and then we'll just divide by the, the um, far plane. So this is going to end up looking like negative uh, view. Uh, view pos we don't have this variable yet so we can't compile this divided by a hundred which is our um far field for our camera i think this might work so we need a model to we need a world to view matrix which is fine we could do this oh yeah i'm trying to compile it already that won't work chris it won't work um go and find the rendering code and it's here so instead of world to clip we're also going to have world to view and yeah we will we will actually clean this up properly Let, let's do this so we're going to have world to view matrix we're going to have world pos and view pos is going to be times world to view world pos and then The clip position is going to be view to clip of view pos. So this needs to become view to clip 100f0. Oops. What was wrong there? Uh, there's no z when used like that. Bat. World to view times world to view. World position. 
Oh, cool. Right. Okay. So this is the error I'm now expecting because down here we're doing world to clip, and now it's going to be view to clip, and that's just going to be the matrix, the projection matrix. Sorry. I will get these words right one day. World to view, view to clip. Try that. And then here, and then continue. Not super convincing though, is it? I want something to change when I get close, and it's just nothing. Nothing. What am I doing? Okay, and uh, wow. <laughs> Well, that was disappointing. I wonder why. Right, let's bring our blur. Just these little reminders that I don't know what I'm doing yet. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, I'm getting the hang of this. There's a rendering stuff. Nope. X, Y, Z. Come on. Oh yeah. Hold up. That's... That's what I'm expecting to see. And then up here, we were taking the view position. And passing over to here. And the Z, the reason I negated it is because the view position is going to be is going to be like z negative z is forward so i wanted to turn this positive and then divide it by 100 because that was going to be my far field and we haven't um done any of the projection or that kind of stuff yet so i thought i thought that would just be in i thought that would be right damn it I wonder what i'm doing here then and then some frag stage this is interesting so what happens if i just do let's not completely get rid of that if I just take the view position, the Z of view, and slam it in there, and... Nothing. Okay. So negative Z was... was a positive value. That's what I expected. Wait a second, though. That's correct. Why? What is different from before? Divide by 100 F0. But you're the same. No, it's not. <gasps> that was the difference. Oh, you idiot. Okay, fine. Typo. I can live with a typo. Okay, so that is roughly what we want. So now we've got a linear depth. Further away, the brighter, the nearer. Fine. Cool. So now we can remove these guys. Holy shit. Right, and uh, we don't need to worry about depth anymore because we're not going to pass it as a separate, a separate sampler. That's going to throw an error because we're still trying to pass it here. That means we don't need this. Um, that means in play with verts, we don't need to pass it here either. We don't need a depth sample at all. I'm going to say continue. That's a problem. Symbol depth is undefined. Depth. Oh yeah, we don't need that anymore. Depth is actually going to be the W component of... Um, oh, this. So we can do uh, full is this here. 
Sorry, I know I'm not explaining anything right now. <laughs> I've got just enough brain cycles to work out what I'm doing. And uh, yeah, there we go. So now it seems like... Oh, that's a bit janky, but something's happening. Um... I would have expected that to fall off a bit quicker, but never mind. <laughs> Doesn't look so different than when we use the other one. But anyway, things that are further away, like this guy over here now seem to have a smaller um, aberration than others. But then again, this guy doesn't look like he's got much either. So I don't know what we've achieved here. Oh yeah, so actually as we get further away, the aberration's getting bigger. Which is probably correct, given... Depth, zero, zero, zero. What is it? Further away you are, the higher the value is. So, yes, this. So we do one minus, and then we should saturate it to make sure it never goes out of bounds. You should always saturate your powers, but you should also saturate this as well. Um, <laughs> and then we still need a limiting factor. Otherwise it looks ridiculous. Where is that S? Oh, it's there. Okay. So we've got some kind of depth-based scaling. Hopefully as I get further away. I suppose these are getting smaller. Um, I'm not really convinced that we've got that right yet, but it should be. So scale direction, depth, yeah. Whatever. Anyway, I'm kind of satisfied that we've got some chromatic aberration going on. How are you folks doing? Yeah, thinking out loud, man, that's... It, it, it's fine. It's part of the reason like doing these streams is slightly strange. Because it's... Uh, I talk to think a lot of the time. Um, and so, yeah, this is... <laughs> this is a good way for me to just end up rabbiting shit. I have no idea what I've said for the last five minutes. So it's... Um... Oh, Barrett, you've got uh, kicked out again. Uh oh, what's Pond up him saying? <laughs> Some mind blown stuff. Oh, this is cool though. I really would love to get this uh, a little better though. What could we do? What happens if we like? Let's let's square the depth. So then, yeah, the further away stuff is going to have even more effect. <laughs> That's interesting. And this is, I guess this is at the point now where it's just, uh, what? <laughs> where we just play with it. Okay, so now it's, yeah, only things far away are. Of high chromatic aberration. That's interesting. Whoa! I tell you what, actually, we could, um, because the the step distance is based on the distance to the focus, if we normalize this vector to begin with, and then set the length of it based on the depth, that would actually work better. I think. Yeah, let's just play with that quickly. Let's, uh, okay, so let's, before I completely fuck everything up. Da 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 da. We've got this. This looks okay. 
let's uh, do this one last time. Push, so it's available, and now I can break it. So my thinking is, and the reason I'm mumbling to myself about this, is the original um, process we're going through is we pick a point, we sample along a line towards the center. Then we have some fudge factor here, which would say don't sample as far. But that still means out here, we're sampling halfway to the center. And then here, we're, ha we're um, going halfway to the center. So these lengths are very different. Um, based where the fragment is. So it's really still based on the distance from the center and not just from the depth. So if I take this thing here and normalize it and then we multiply that by the depth, something based on the depth, we're gonna get something a bit more sensible. I think, let's try it. And that will easily wrap up the stream. And then we can go round the back for the old brandy there. Um, let's have a look. So what do we do? We're going to normalize this. Now that is one. So that's going to end up with some very big blurs. Um, we're going to multiply by one minus depth saturated. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, that was interesting. No, that was uh, that was already in the right range. Interesting. Cool. What the fuck? <laughs> so all of the directions should be one now. So. Wow, okay. So yeah, it's basically there. It's just the number's way bigger than I expected. Having to divide it by a thousand to get it into a sensible range. Interesting. I guess now that... Um, so dividing it by... A hundred is going to get the full... No, dividing it by 200. Oh, that is interesting. What is that artifact I'm seeing in the center? That just screams wrongness. What have I done here? So, we've got the focus, we've minus the UV. This gets us a, a, a vector towards the center. We've normalized that, so now that vector is 1. We said the number of steps is 64, that's fine. We've sampled something, whatever. Um, we've taken the color and the depth from the various things, that's groovy. We're not using depth yet, so it really doesn't matter. Um, we've taken that direction and we've scaled it by something. Let's say, let's say a thousand. Um, so it should mean that the size of the aberration is same everywhere. That is so interesting. Is that just a fuck up? Is this just errors based around around the center point? That's kind of interesting. I'm gonna have to noodle around and see what that is. Um, but yeah, let's then if we do this and we just shift this um, this value around. I suppose we can just do this here. So. Let's okay, so now the distance does seem to be having an effect. Yeah, the further away, the bigger the aberration. The nearer, the less. Okay, let's flip that. Nearer it gets worse, further away. Yeah, further away looks worse as well. What have I done? 
What is this? Who knows? It's got to be divided. What is, what is that in the center? That's really interesting. Oh, well, I've got some interesting things to research anyway. Hmm. Anyone spot the fault in my logic here? There is one. I just can't see it right now. I can imagine there being an error around here because... Because, yeah, the difference is just going to become... Like, it, when you get very close to zero, you're going to start getting floating point errors on just the... Ah! When you subtract two very small uh, floating point numbers, you're going to start getting errors around that area. So I don't mind that so much. It's some of this stuff out here that I haven't quite got through my head yet. But, meh. It's all things to learn. I'm happy that we're just moving quickly on this. Um, it's a lens! Absolutely. Ponder Pimp, having to leave. See you, mate. Uh, to be honest, I think we're all going to head off in a second, so that works well. So, uh, yeah. Thank you very much for tuning in. I have time for um, any questions or any comments or things you want me to poke at the code in these last few minutes. And uh, otherwise, we will call it a night. Before I get any more rambly. Now after this, oh, I can read about garbage collection. And I'm blurry. Come on. There we are. We're back in. This is interesting. Oh yeah, also um, my mate came around, Ferris actually, uh, came around the other day and we've started looking into doing depth of field in Lisp. We're taking it very slowly so I can try and build up the intuition. Uh, but that does mean like he's off to the US for a few weeks. So the depth of field won't be finished until he comes back. There's all kinds of demo parties and shit going on as well before then. So yeah, I think I think next month sometime I'll have a stream showing the uh, some depth of field stuff done in Lisp as well. Which would be great because then at that point we can flesh out the shadow map stuff. We can, we've got some nasty chromatic aberration stuff we can throw on there. We can uh, pull in the physics stuff that we've got and and some depth of field. And I really should get back to doing the physically based rendering stuff at some point, but I kept on slamming my head against that. But I'm getting closer, I guess. And at that point, we've almost got enough parts for a little deferred rendering game engine-y thing. So we might do that for some streams as well. Who knows? Black Hole Sun, and we're done. All right. Thank you very much, folks. See you next time. Peace.